So the last section is emerging therapy. So right now there's a lot of excitement about gene therapy. And currently there's a lentiglobin uh, product that is used to treat severe sickle cell disease using the gene therapy mechanism. So Dr. Cantor, can you talk about um, the Walters abstract and what we should look forward to with the gene therapy um, um, for sickle cell disease? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's important to know there's two different types really more than two, but two kind of buckets of gene therapy. One is what we would consider gene addition therapy. We're actually adding in a gene, but not changing the genome of the person that we're adding that gene to. So in sickle cell disease, we do this by adding in a gene that makes healthy normal hemoglobin, hemoglobin A in this trial. And in gene editing, you're actually doing a different thing where you go in and actually edit the genome. And you can do this at several different places and there's different abstracts that do this in different ways to either increase fetal hemoglobin, that baby hemoglobin that's healthier, or that even have the potential to edit the sickle hemoglobin itself and increase hemoglobin A. And that's still in the mice and not yet in the people. But what we're seeing in lentiglobin so far, we have two abstracts actually, um, that are looking at both the first groups, groups A and B, and then the group C, the most current group. And what we're seeing is super exciting, can't, can't lie. Um, our A and B groups show sustained T87Q production. So in those first groups, we didn't get as high as we wanted that hemoglobin, that healthy hemoglobin, it worked, they made some, but not enough. Not enough to be what we would consider curative. Mm -hmm. um, disease modifying for sure. Um, and, and definitely those individuals have decreased symptoms of disease, but they're still making quite a lot of sickle hemoglobin. Um, as we move into our group C though, we're seeing their phenotype, their blood looks just like someone with sickle cell trait. And so it seems to be moving along those curative lines um, all the way through from A to C. We know that it's persistent. So some of our patients who were in that first group are now three, three and a half years out, and they have that same amount of gene, of that new gene being expressed. So we don't see that gene going away. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing it's very safe, and that we're not seeing any of the concerns for viral, uh, what we call the reappearance of the virus. Mm -hmm. So we, we turn the virus off when we put it in, and we're not seeing it turn back on. And we're not seeing that the new gene puts itself in the genome anywhere that it could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So one of the big concerns with gene addition therapy is that that gene could insert and turn on a cancer gene. And we're not seeing that, which is really that's, encouraging. That's really exciting, because I think that's the biggest challenge we've had with gene therapy for other conditions, right? Absolutely. So you try to fix one problem, you cause another problem. But it looks like this seems to be moving in the right direction. So far, so good. I mean, certainly we're seeing great gene insertion um, right where it's supposed to be without any, um, what we would call a clonal response and uh, great hemoglobin production that we hope um, will be curative someday. Right now, what we can tell you is that the hemoglobins are looking fantastic. And um, the hemolysis hemolo that we've been talking about is just about gone. The other big excitement about gene therapy is that it doesn't have the problems that we spoke about earlier in terms of a stem cell true. transplant and that all patients don't need a donor, they're their own donor. And it also removes one of the major post-transplant complications of graft-versus-host disease. So immediately opens up a therapy to all patients uh, and removes one of the more um, uh, concerning morbidities post-transplant. And I know one of the, the therapies is happening at your hospital. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, that therapy there? So we also have a gene addition approach using a lentiviral vector, but instead of inserting the uh, modified lentiglobin, uh, beta-globin uh, type, we're actually trying to use a different non-sickling globin. And so in this case, we would be trying to reactivate the gamma globin um, by knocking down a transcription factor called BC11A, which is known to make that uh, <coughs> fetal to adult switch in the, in the perinatal period. And so by harnessing this natural machinery, we try to flip back or switch back to making fetal hemoglobin. But again, it's another gene addition approach. Um, it's quite interesting and in it's a single hairpin RNA knockdown approach. So it's a really the first time that's been used in gene therapy, which is quite exciting. And uh, we'll also be presenting here the uh, five patients who've been treated so far and have had um, a quite a good effect with the fetal hemoglobin induction, both uh, from a, a hematologic indices point of view as well as from a clinical point of view. And toxicity? So really the toxicity seems to be uh, mostly related to the myeloablative conditioning that is still used uh, in all of these gene therapy trials. And so ultimately once we have a proof of principle that these um, integrative or gene addition approaches are helpful, then maybe we'll be able to move to reduce the toxicity related to the conditioning. So the million dollar question is how much does this cost? Well, we actually have a <coughs> 1.5 to $2 million answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> so. The therapy has actually been approved in thalassemia in Europe, mm -hmm. and it does carry a price tag that's pretty hefty. Um, 
it's a price tag that is only paid if successful. Mm -hmm. The way that they have um, done this in Europe is that it, it I think it's two million? 1.5, 1.8 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 8 million, 1. 8 over, million five years. over five years. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, so, but it's only done if the gene therapy is successful. Correct. It's it's given in, in segments mm -hmm. to ensure that it's not just successful, but pretty much curative. Correct. It's kind of like a mortgage, so if you... <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you but it gives you optimism. <laughs> I mean, I think that the price tag is definitely something that we're going to have to have continued discussions about. But at least from a sickle cell standpoint, uh, it gives you optimism that we have... A, another disease, uh, you know, chronic blood disease, which has a cleaner outcome technically. They're on transfusions, and now they're not on transfusions, where sickle cell disease is much more nuanced for sure. Um, but, but I think that that is definitely something that... Uh, and so that sounds like a very hefty price tag, but I think, Vera, you mentioned earlier that a, one sickle cell individual could cost that much in a year with severe chronic organ damage. Conce conceivably, I think a, a 1.8 million might be high, but conceivably there are some patients who spend more days of the year in the hospital than out. They're in the minority, but that does exist. Um, and over their novel lifespan. Th the novel therapies that we're talking about right now, the ones that were FDA approved, are not cheap. Um, the estimates based on what the companies have put out in press releases are, are about $100,000 per annum. Uh, for disease modifying therapy. So it wouldn't take you that many years of being on two. one, maybe two, maybe yep, three, three of these <laughs> disease modifying therapies to before you've already paid for, you've Absolutely. paid for your gene, gene therapy. therapy. Yeah. But yeah. the question is, um, in a single payer system, that, that's pretty clean, but in a, in a system like we have in the United States, so who's on the hook for the for the for the, yeah. for the amortized you know for the life cost? Right. Is, is, yeah. So if more than half of, of patients living with sickle cell disease in this country right now have Medicaid and they have Medicaid at the time that they get their gene therapy, but then they, they get healthy and, and they're they able to work and, and they get insurance. they get private insurance. Who's on the hook for years three, four, and five? Is it still Medicaid? Is it the private payer? Is it going to make it hard for people who are in that five-year window to get insured elsewhere? I mean, I don't know that those details have been worked out. But, but, you know, we really have such a problem with that in that so many of our patients are on disability so that they can have health insurance. Mm -hmm, you know, they, they want to work, and we all know that working is productive for everyone. And so, you know, I think it's important that, that people, when they see an individual with sickle cell disease who, ha who is on disability, really understand that sometimes it's, it's unfortunately a, it's a forced, yeah. there is no other option for that individual. Because if they work too much, they lose their insurance benefits. Mm -hmm. It's not the SSI benefits they're worried about, it's the medical insurance. They can't get the medication, they can't, you know, pay for preventive care, and then they live their life in the hospital and spend more money on the acute care side and do poor. So. It is a complicated, very nuanced conversation that will continue to happen over the next several years.